example, last time we saw the uh, the relevant group of transformations uh, that uh, uh, that preserve the the the, the wave uh, front, the light wave front. Uh, if we call lambda, is the one that preserve this. Uh, uh, this metric tensor, the Minkowski metric, right? Now, uh, today, uh, uh, I want to introduce the, the four vectors. Why? Because uh, like uh, in ordinary space-only uh, space physics, we write all our equations in terms of vectors, right? Like uh, Maxwell equations that uh, we wrote the first day. And the reason there is that if you write your equations by using uh, space, three-dimensional space vectors, they are automatically invariant under rotations, right? That's the reason why we write uh, uh, using vectors. Uh, even though at the end of the day, we, when we do computation, then we have to work with components. So the idea here is that uh, uh, instead of uh, 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 writing uh, vector-like uh, equations, uh, by looking at uh, uh, objects like uh, three-dimensional vectors that are invariant under rotation, we look uh, to objects that are invariant under uh, this particular form of rotation that are the uh, rotation and Lorentz boost in uh, space-time, uh, so four-dimensional space-time. So we want something like a, so an arbitrary vector. So, so I, now I don't know because the, the, this is for the three dimensions. So let's call it like this. So this is an object that has components, right? But it has four components instead of, of three. So uh, it has a, 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 a so a naught is the component along the time-like uh, uh, direction. So if you write uh, and then uh, the, the three dimensional part. So you have the x. Uh, Right, uh, so this this is the thing that uh, so uh, unfortunately uh, well it, it, so so think this is the three dimensional space uh, of which I draw only say two components, and then you have the t time like component like this, so this is a vector, but it's a vector in a four dimensional space, okay. So you, you must be, by now you should feel uh, comfortable thinking of vectors in n-dimensional spaces, right? I mean, it doesn't matter. So this is a particular case. It's a vector in four dimensions. And the only part, I mean, something that, uh, so, so this, you, you can write it, uh, write the usual, uh, by using the, the components. Uh, and it goes from, uh, say, 0 to 3, right? Where at 0, we, we look at the... Or sometimes you, you see it like this, a0, and then the, the vector part, right? So that uh, you remember the space, three-dimensional space component. That's the old uh, uh, vectors that we already knew. And then it has a component in the, in the time-like direction. In this language, uh, the generic boost that we study, uh, the Lorentz boost that we study uh, last lectures uh, is going to be, so it's a transformation, right, that mixes uh, the time uh, uh, component with the spatial one. So you have a boost in a certain direction, so you get to transform the, the, the zero component with this gamma. Remember, gamma is 1 over the square root of 1 minus beta square. A0 minus B, OK? So this is a, and this is 1 over the square root of 1 minus beta square. So if this is the direction of the boost, right? So then the, uh, the, uh, the component in that direction, so you have to introduce some. So let's, let's call the, the component parallel to the direction of the boost, get boosted up. And the one that are transverse to the direction, uh, there are uh, two mores, right? Those are left uh, unchanged. So this is the generic boost, generic Lorentz boost. Is, is this clear? I mean, 
So you see, they are more symmetrical in this notation because you remember, uh, if you want to go back to the one with t and x, right, you have to remember that this is like a ct, right? This is ct, so you get an extra c down here. You get the results that I wrote uh, the other time. But in this form, as component, uh, so th this can be, for, for instance, the coordinates, but they can be any vector, okay? Any vector. And we are going to write like velocity, acceleration. Those are four vectors as well. Uh, and we, uh, this is true for, uh, for, for any vectors that can be written in this form. So from now on, we, we, we stick to this, this notation. And uh, as we have the scalar product, we have the scalar product of two vectors, right, that is an invariant. Similarly, here we, we have the scalar product of two, of two four vectors. Right, so it's something like this. And clearly this is, a, well, a, a convenient way to, to write this. I, I can write it with this notation. So I have E, uh, the basis vector, so alpha dot the beta, right? And then here you have the corresponding component of these four vectors. This object here, that is the scalar product of the unit vectors in the uh, is, uh, is what uh, I call G, but uh, it maybe it's better to call it eta alpha beta. That is the metric tensor. You see, it tells you how you do this uh, uh, scalar product. And if you remember, this uh, eta alpha beta is not just the, the Kronecker symbol because it has this minus one here, right? So this is the metric tensor for this space. So for, for three-dimensional vectors, you could have done the same, but in that case, this eta would have been this part here, so it would have been just the identity, right, that you write as a, a chronic. Yeah. But uh, because of the Minkowski property of the space, this is not the identity. It has a minus one there. Mm. And in fact, in general, you can write uh, the, the, the measure, a distance in this space, right, like uh, that is not uh, uh, like eta alpha beta dx alpha dx beta, right? This is the generalization of the usual distance in which you just have uh, here the identity matrix. Then here you have dx squared plus dy squared, right? But here it's not because it's like minus uh, c squared dt squared plus dx squared plus d. That's good. I think there's something I'm stuck. Okay. Or in general, say it's minus. You see a. Well, it, it, it's like here, so I can write minus a b naught plus a, where this is the usual uh, scalar product for two three-dimensional vectors. Okay. So this space that is uh, our extension of the three-dimensional space is called the Minkowski, the four-dimensional Minkowski space. So I don't know, Minkowski 4. And is the, the space, space where we actually live. And it becomes relevant, as, uh, as we already s uh, discussed, when uh, the, the velocities that we are studying in our system become uh, close to the speed of light because otherwise the, the, this, the fact that uh, we are in a four-dimensional space uh, is not so, so evident, okay? And what is important about this quantity? Well, it's the same as in three dimension, right? The scalar product was important because it's an invariant under rotation. And here's the same, it's invariant under this uh, uh, Lorentz uh, transformations on top of the usual rotation. So these are, are invariant quantities, are the same for all uh, uh, systems connected by Lorentz transformations. So uh, if you uh, did you know about these four vectors before? Uh, have you or it's the first time you 
you heard four vectors uh, is that uh, yeah well, I don't know, I'm asking. <laughs> okay, if you are uh, comfortable with this, then uh, we can uh, uh, start writing some, uh, we, we want to study some dynamics in this space, in particular uh, then uh, for electromagnetic fields and charged particles. So we need the, the, the extension of, of familiar ideas, like uh, what, what is the velocity, so the four velocity. So the extension of the of the ordinary velocity. So this is usually called u. So let, let's stick to component. Uh, so it's a four vector, and you want to define this. You see now the difficulty is that uh, the velocity is the space divide is the time derivatives of of space, right? But uh, now it's a bit tricky because. Uh, 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 you see, ta uh, you, uh, the usual velocity is a vector because it's the derivative of a vector, right? Because t is the scalar, so you take the derivative, x is a vector, so this is the vector. But now this is not longer true because t itself is just a component of a four vector, the coordinate. So if you take this, it's not, it's not going to give you a, a vector. So what you uh, have to introduce. Uh, is the derivative of, of, uh, of the coordinate, right? <coughs> but with respect to an invariant that is called the proper time. So the proper time is essentially the time marked by a clock that moves with the observer, okay? And that is, uh, uh, it has to do, so this is called the proper time. And you see that now this, this is, this, these are the coordinates that we already uh, decided they are four vector because they transform in, in the way I wrote under Lorentz transformation. And therefore, the four velocity is a vector as well. What is the relation uh, uh, between this proper time and what we call time? Well, uh, you see, the proper time is defined to be, uh, usually in this form here, is uh, essentially, so you take an interval, this we, you know that is an invariant square, right? The interval in four dimensions, and you divide it by C because that uh, gives you a, 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 a units of time, right? So this, this is the definition of this proper time. So essentially the distance uh, in units uh, of C. But then you see that uh, you can uh, write this, so it's the square, so I have to take the, the, the square root. So dA square is what I wrote there before, right? So uh, let me write it here, is minus 1 over C square, right? That multiply uh, what? Minus uh, uh, C square dT square plus uh, the, the, the vector-like part, right? So you, t you see that I can take the square of that, right? And I have uh, uh, the c, 1 over c, right? Uh, c squared dt squared minus dx squared. And if you pull out now the dt, if you pull out the dt, and you pull back the c, you see this is gives you the... the relation between this proper time and the t as fourth component of the coordinate for momentum. And this is, of course, is this 1 over gamma. So uh, this is like dt over gamma. And this is the usual be beta factor of the Lorentz uh, transformation. So if you wish, this is the, the, the this uh, uh, retardation effect that you have uh, in going from the from the proper time to the t time as measured from the other observer, right? So this is the, the, the connection between the two. But really what, uh, what you need is the proper time in this context. That is the local time of the, of the observer. So if this is the four velocity then, uh, what are the, so then we can, uh, just to understand a little better, let's look at the uh, individual components one by one. So the time, 
component, the u naught, right, is the dx naught divided by d tau. But we, we, we have seen that the dx naught, right, the dx naught is what? Uh, the x naught is defined to be t times c. So it's c dt divided by d tau. And d tau is this thing here. So it's 1 minus uh, e square divided by c square. So that's the, the, the time component. And the other the others components, so the u vectors, the other three components, these are the dx vector the proper time. OK, so I can write this uh, in the usual dt. dx dt, that's the, what I call v, the velocity. And then I have the derivative of dt with respect to tau. So you see that, again, dt over d tau is just this factor. So here I have the usual v divided by this factor, 1 minus v squared. C squared. So if you want, this is the, the this uh, contraction or, with respect to time, this uh, uh, retardation effect due to the Lorentz metric. So the space-like uh, uh, components of the four velocity are essentially the usual velocity. In fact, I can always go to the limits in which uh, v over c is much smaller than 1, and this goes exactly in what we call the velocity uh, up to today. And the same here, uh, this goes simply to the speed of light. So the time-like component is just uh, the, the speed of light in this uh, in this, uh, in fact, in general, I can write uh, the the u uh, the u alpha or u bar, right? You see, it's like uh, uh, there is this factor uh, gamma that uh, you can pull out one over. So it's gamma c v. This is the four velocity. If you want to split the the time-like component from the space, uh, three-dimensional space uh, component. And then uh, you already know how they transform, like velocity, uh, because uh, they transform as, transform as the component uh, of a uh, four vector, so exactly like the coordinates, so uh, it's, it's the one I want there. So you don't have to redo all this stuff, the sum over the velocities, you know, uh, how do they, everything is encoded here. You don't have to worry about all these uh, strange rules that you derive for relativity. It just comes from uh, writing everything in this uh, four vector notations. Okay, so questions? You think, I I is it useful or do you like these four vectors or not? I think they are kind of neat. Uh, and uh, what we are going to, I mean, this is the language in which uh, from now on you should write all your equations. This is my point. Because, uh, I mean, unless you work in solid state physics, I mean, uh, in, uh, so if you are working in high energy physics, everything is very close to the speed of light, so it's relevant to write it in the correct language. So as before, you were very careful to write all your equations with vectors so that you were guaranteed that by rotating nothing would have happened. Now you have to do the same with the same care and writing everything with these four, uh, four vectors. Uh, and we are going to write for in a second uh, or maybe in a few minutes uh, Maxwell equations and uh, Lorentz force in this language. But before, I, I, I have to give you some exercises for Monday that I guess is the last, uh, your last chance to to do some homework. So the first, I, I, ah, maybe I should mention that uh, in some, so I wrote the, uh, the uh, Minkowski metric in this form, right? Uh, of course, this is not completely unique. In some books, uh, you, you will find uh, this other metric. Uh, OK, so I guess. Uh, I don't know what uh, somebody, it depends uh, which one you study first, and then you, it's very hard to switch. Uh, I suggest you stick to this, but uh, 
this one uh, has the, um, you see, it has the, the wrong sign on the time and the right sign here. So in a way, I, I think it's more, it reminds you that the, the odd guy is the time. No? The other one will be just the opposite. You have this positive and that minus. So, but uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think most of the recent books use, use, use this metric. Some of the older, they use the other one. But OK, everything is, uh, is exactly the same. But uh, you, it's like the units. It's like, uh, you know, it, as everything is the same as long as you are consistent. I mean, you have to use the same metric. I'm saying this because, so first, uh, write what is the scalar product of, uh, so verify that the scalar product of uh, the, the square of the four for velocity is equal to minus c square with this, with this metric, of course, otherwise it flips. Okay, that's kind of trivial, uh, essentially. Then, so one, to by using this, uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, maybe I, I should add a, a, a footnote here. Clearly, now that you have the velocity, it's easy to introduce the momentum, right? So you can have the the four momentum, the four momentum that is going to be just uh, uh, what? I, if you multiply by the mass, this, uh, this quantity, right, uh, is going to be your four momentum. So uh, and you see, uh, what is the, what, what are the, co now, now that's kind of interesting in the sense that now, if you look at the component of this object, you see that the, the zero component, so the p naught, uh, is just uh, uh, is just uh, m. Uh, uh, that thing there, right? Is m uh, uh, so uh, if you use this, is m c divided by one minus v square c square. Uh, actually, MC, yeah, MC. And P, well, then P is just uh, MV. And uh, so this, uh, again, in the, in the non-relativistic limit, this goes in the usual uh, momentum, and this goes into the this uh, central, the, 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 the mass time, the speed of light. Now, if you, I mean, this quantity here, in, in, in really old books, uh, uh, is called the mass. And then this is called the rest mass. Meaning the mass measured by the observer, uh, so if I, measure, if I measure my mass, that's my rest mass. Then if I start moving and somebody is measuring that mass, that is this mass here. This is a completely uh, useless concept. I think let's call M is the rest mass, and that's the only mass that uh, is sensible to, to measure. Then this is just the, 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 the boost factor due to the fact that uh, you are moving with a certain speed, if you agree. Otherwise, just to call this the rest mass. Then, uh, you know, you have all these discussions about, you see, as, as this goes close to the speed of light, then this mass uh, diverges, and then that's the reason why you cannot go faster than light. But I, I, I could never un really understand this. Uh, I think uh, it's just that there is no boost to the speed. I mean, that it requires an infinite boost to, to, to go at the speed of light. So, I mean, there is only one mass. That's the rest mass. I don't know. But then, uh, okay, you see, so if you draw, here you have time, right? And here you have space, and you have your trajectory, per se, in, in space and time. Then uh, it, it's kind of neat, you see, because this is like energy in a way. 
So the component in this direction gives you the energy, and the component in this direction gives you the momentum. So the components, mm -hmm. they may change, and that's already suggesting how you see, you, you get a lot of uh, concepts that were uh, separated uh, in the ordinary language of uh, uh, Cartesian's coordinates, uh, uh, three-dimensional space, they get uh, unified in this language because you see, for instance, energy and momentum were separated, right? It was P and E, but now you see essentially the energy is a component of the same object that is the form momentum. So if that was the form velocity, this is the form momentum. That's already is telling you that uh, energy and momentum, they are not this, I mean, they are not separate concepts. And in fact, this, after having told you this, you can try the second exercise. Uh, that uh, is to show that the, the, the rest mass of a particle is linked to its energy and momentum by the very famous E equal, well, I guess I, I want to write it like this, E square is equal to M square C square plus P square. I have a C square here. Well, I guess. Okay, well. No, I think it's, uh, it's like this, right? Because P square. Uh, because this is a, a this is a, a, a P square, right? This is a the units I, I'm thinking. So these are the same units. This is an energy, but it's a, Okay, check the, the correct one. So I think the one you are thinking is the one with the fourth here, right? Okay, whatever. I, I'm just used to take C equal to one, so I'm always... No, well, uh, you, you have to use this to rederive this. This, of course, is the very famous E. If, if you... If you go to a frame in which uh, this is not there. This is equal to mc square. Right, that uh, you read uh, in all, uh, on a t-shirt. But uh, the, the correct one is this one, right? This is a special case if you are in a frame uh, at rest with respect to the, to the energy you are measuring. And the third, uh, you can take, take the limit of V, the non-relativistic limit of this, and, and uh, study how, what is the energy in this limit. OK, that's uh, very quick. And uh, uh, Of course, uh, uh, I, I guess uh, what is uh, new here is that uh, you have this relation uh, between the mass, the rest mass, and the energy, right? That means that, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, before we, we thought of the energy and just the kinetic energy, right? And now you, you see that even 
for a particle at rest, uh, you have a lot of energy in, in the mass. Because uh, from here, you see that uh, the mass uh, is, uh, is part of the, uh, you see, the, this component, the mc square component uh, of the, it's just a component of a four vector, so they, they can be reshuffled around, okay? So, but, I mean, that's not the... Uh, were you about to... No, I mean, the, this is the, the photon has zero rest mass. This is a particle, a massive particle. So a massive particle is a particle that has a, a, a mass, a finite mass in the rest frame of the particle. The photon, uh, well, you, you are not even supposed to know about the photons, so but... Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, the, the photon is exactly massless. It's very important. No, no, it's very important because otherwise the, uh, it, 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 they will not be, you, if you remember all those radiation fields that uh, those, they go like one over R, but if you have a mass, they, they go down much faster. I mean, if you give a mass, even a tiny mass to the photon, then the radiation field goes down much faster than one over R. So we know for sure that the photon has a mass, uh, I mean, if it has a mass, it's, it's really, no, it, it really, it's really tiny. No, that's what I said. I don't understand this distinction. But what is a relativistic mass? This is, for me, when I write M, is the rest mass. Because it's the only one that you can measure. I mean, the, the rest is uh, some. Any other question? No, the rest mass does not change. It's an invariant. It's a scalar. Well, what you see is this uh, sort of, uh, but uh, that's not the mass. It's just the fact that uh, is the the Lorentz uh, boost on the time component of the momentum that you are seeing. Then, if you if you want to call this the mass and this is the rest mass, you are welcome. But uh, at the end, you you confuse yourself. <laughs> I assure you, because then you know starts thinking. You you see all these things in the in the books that uh, they are kind of. I mean, it's simpler like this. What is the mass? Is what you measure to be the mass. To measure that, you have to be in the same frame of this object. So it's the rest mass. Then uh, there is no, no other uh, objects. Then you have four vectors, four momenta, and then components of this. Stick to this, and uh, you never embarrass yourself. <laughs> yes. I want to know how, because one page called zero, there is not a motion. So where we can, where, where, where form this, uh, this insert image? Where does it come from? Why you have this, uh, well, I mean, because uh, the energy is not uh, a scalar any longer. It's the component of, you see, the energy is a component of, uh, of, uh, of a four vector, essentially. And this component has parts that come from the momentum, right, depending on the frame uh, of reference. So the momentum carries energy, and uh, you know, the, all these things get mixed up. So the fact that a lot of energy is uh, frozen into the mass is just a question of uh, who, who's observing these things. Is there, uh, if, uh, if there is uh, not another uh, kind of mass, I think the second Newton law should drop. Well, we are going to write uh, the second is F equal ma, right? Yeah, we, we are going to write that uh, because all you need is to write an acceleration. I wrote the vector and the momentum, so I'm going to write an acceleration, and then you have Newton's law. You see, I mean, yeah. It's going to be, but w w the inertial mass is the rest mass.
but I, I don't I don't understand what what, what is worrying How you. Can you save uh, the rhythm just one mass? Well, I mean, uh, yeah. The It's going to be modified. Oh. We have to write the Newton's law in this four vector language. <coughs> so we'll have a four force that will be equal to the rest mass times a four velocity, uh, four acceleration. Then when you insist, you see, your problem comes only when you insist in splitting this. Then uh, you sort of call this part, uh, uh, you know, the old uh, velocity, but uh, but let, 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 let. I think I'm, I'm going to do that. But before I want to give you a few more. Uh, so uh, actually, uh, uh, this four uh, four vectors. Uh, Notation is useful to solve a, a, a large number of exercises in which you have uh, particles. So, so we are back to this uh, sort of point particles, uh, uh, but uh, they just uh, sort of uh, uh, so take point particles like electrons and uh, let's take also the photon and assume that it's a particle as well but of course it's a special particle because it has zero mass right so by using this we, we can do many exercises that uh, reproduce uh, important results for, for instance you see that the conservation laws uh, it's just uh, that the, the sum of the momenta before and after some collisions must be the same. And this is the full conservation. You see, in one equation, you have the energy conservation and the momentum conservation. So in particular, for instance, you can show that uh, a, a well-known result, that a free electron, a free electron, okay, uh, uh, cannot uh, emit or absorb a photon. Did you know that? <laughs> if you have a free electron, so a, a, a little guy here going around, he cannot emit or absorb a photon. So if, if you hit it with the photon, so how do you convince yourself that this is the case? It has to do with the conservation. So this is the exercise though. So call uh, P gamma the momentum of this photon and PE, the four momentum of the electron, right? And then it's going to be a, a four momentum of the electron after the, the let, let's assume that is absorbed. So at the beginning you have two momenta, then at the end you have the final momentum of this electron. It's just an exercise in kinematics. So by using the, uh, the so okay, prove that uh, it's not possible. Or, in other words, it's only possible if the energy of the photon is zero. But if the energy of the photon is zero, that means that you don't have the photon. Because the photon has no mass. So the only thing that can have is energy. If you take even the energy away from the photon, the photon is gone. Right? <laughs> Prove that uh, it's not possible to... So in other words, uh, you write the conservation law that is this, right? You have the sum of the four momenta. So I drop these things uh, from now on because we only have four vectors. So if I write something like this, this is the four vector. So this is the conservation. So take the square, do something, some uh, massage this thing until you get something that is impossible, unless the energy of the photon is there. And then you have proof that. Uh, so you see. Uh, you need a bound electron in order to, to have uh, emission. Or you need the, the field uh, to, to conserve the energy in order to have that. So all these atomic spectra are only possible. So you don't have atomic spectra for a free electron because of this. Yes? If I saw on, on some papers that they, they push a limit for photon mass, yeah. even if it is a small 
Oh, yeah. So yeah, because that's the, the experimental physics, right? You, 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 you never believe what uh, the theorists tell them. But, uh, so, but it's correct, you measure. In fact, I think the first chapter of Jackson's is about the measure of the mass of the photon. And you see the bound is, uh, I don't know, 10 to the minus, uh, very, very it's very tiny. Of course, we have a stronger argument because, you see, the fact that the photon is massless has to do with the gauge invariance that we discuss of the Maxwell equation. And if you believe that the, the equations describing the electromagnetic fields are gauge invariance, then it follows that uh, the mass is zero. I I'll show you this the, the last minute of my last class, <laughs> if we have time. But uh, in your mind, you must think, OK, from the theorist point of view, the photon is massless because Maxwell equations are gauge invariant. So in other words, a mass term for the photon would break gauge invariance explicitly. Since we believe that gauge invariance is a fundamental symmetry, or better, a fundamental invariance of nature, we are pretty sure that they will never find a mass, uh, uh, a mass for the photon. For the same reason, we are pretty sure that you'll never find a neutrino moving faster than light because we believe in Lorentz invariance. Uh, uh, OK. Anything else? Yeah. For massless particles, uh, what we talk is about their helicity, right? That has to do with the spin of these particles, yeah. or the polarization, yes. Yes. So is this thing always true? I mean, This is always true. No, but this is, is not, it has not to do with the helicity. It's just the conservation of four momenta. Therefore, conservation of energy and the, uh, and the momentum. Do you know about Compton scattering? Have you studied this? OK, so the last. So another homework. Well, try to do as many. Uh, you have to do just uh, this uh, twin uh, stuff, right? No other exercise for me, so you have time to. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, you remember this Compton scattering is, is, is a different problem, right? Is that uh, you have a photon and an electron, and then an electron and a photon. So it's a different process. You have also a P gamma prime, OK? So that is allowed. So by using the same argument, uh, you should be able to derive the famous Compton formula that the wavelengths of the of the uh, the wavelengths of the of, of the photon of light coming off after the scattering is related to the original one by this h m e one minus cosine of theta, where theta is the angle, uh, the scattering angle. Okay. So I guess to do that, uh, you only need uh, to know. Uh, that uh, uh, the p gamma of a photon is uh, can be written like this. Well, this uh, tells you the direction. I don't know. This is the direction of of this momentum, right, in in space. So uh, what I'm saying, because you see, this is the energy. So this will be the frequency, right? And you know that there is this. Uh, I don't know, it's, it's called the, the Planck, uh, no? I think uh, this is the, really the frequency. The new, new lambda is equal to h, right? Or omega is h. Huh? This is New lambda. No, you're right. I mean, uh, what? Help me. <laughs> A? No, what is the? P, yes, P. Ah, yes, OK. And then, uh, ah, OK, then uh, that's right, yeah. So it's like this. OK, sorry. I'm a little. Hey. You, can, you, can, you can wait for that because there is cosine theta. I mean, there is some a picture. A, a pic, 
So it's like this, right? So this is the electron. This is called a Feynman diagram. Well, there are many exercises that uh, you can uh, try and solve. Uh, I don't know if you have time. More about there. About this uh, e equal m c square, you can uh, this is you can measure, for instance, this. Uh, so this is about e equal m c square, right? Just to to get a feeling of the enormous amount of energy that is stored in the mass, uh, if you So uh, you can do this computation. If, if, you, if you go to a gym and uh, you know, the, they have this uh, sort of standing bicycle, and uh, if you go really fast, essentially you, 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 you produce a power of ha half a horsepower, roughly, on a bicycle. So one half horsepower, that's roughly, is 74, well, actually, it's exactly. 74, 746 watts. Now, if you have a, a, a let's assume, so people go to and do that because they want to uh, slim down, right? They want to lose weight. So, assume that the efficiency of this process is, I don't know, 25%, because clearly it's not completely, so only one, one, one fourth. So compute by using this relation, how long, how long do you have to <laughs> go to the gym to lose, say, one kilogram? We are talking years here, I mean, just to give you an idea. Huh? <laughs> well, do the computation, you'll be surprised. So you need to compute, uh, you know, well, it's, it's clear. No, you only need this. Uh, this is horsepower. Just uh, this is the, the power that you seven, seven, use this, 746 watts, because this is in, uh, in CGS. So then you multiply by the seconds in one year to get how much energy you, you, you are consuming. Then you convert into a mass to get one kilo. And of course, since you have this huge factor, you are going to you are going to psych for for a long time. So I want to know how long is that time, how many years. Then you may wonder why people go to the gym, <laughs> but of course uh, you lose weight. Not you you are not losing this weight. You understand, right? You're losing fat, so this is a chemical process that you burn fat, and this is a, it's, it's a completely different thing. So indeed, if you if you go to the gym, you lose uh, weight. But of course, uh, the the best way to lose weight is not to eat, as you know, because uh, our body is extremely efficient. So say you run, and you know, I mean, you run for I don't know, half an hour, you lose, uh, I don't know, uh, 200 kilocalories. Uh, how much uh, food is 200 kilocalories? Do you, you have an idea? You know, one of those snacks that uh, you have, uh, you eat that, that's 200 kilocalories. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we were designed to survive with very little uh, energy. So, I mean, uh, the only way to lose weight is not to eat, I think. To go to the gym is good for other reasons. I mean, to okay, so that's 
Those are your last exercises. Um, I think, or maybe I have some more. So as I said, but, uh, I'm, I'm running a little. So first I want, to, so before we hit the, 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 the Lorentz force and all this stuff, uh, uh, it's useful to, uh, so what is the equivalent, the most basic uh, uh, exercise, if you want, with Newtonian mechanics is the uniformly accelerated motion, right? The, 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 if I drop this, uh, chalk here, uh, it's a uniformly accelerated motion because the gravity is pulling with a constant acceleration on the body, right? And we know the solution is one half uh, g t square, right? Uh, clearly, this cannot be the result in general, in, in special relativity, because uh, something cannot be indefinitely accelerated, right? Because otherwise you will move faster than light. So something must uh, must take place here, and so this is uh, the problem, okay? So let me now take, uh, to avoid uh, further embarrassment with these C factors, let me take C equal to one now. Uh, I guess, uh, well, no. So I have, a, 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 so just to make uh, the problem a little more uh, interesting, so you have a rocket, that accelerate co with a constant acceleration g, let's say, 9.8 meter second square, and, and you launch these things. So how is the, the, the trajectory in, uh, in space-time uh, uh, according to this, uh, what, we, we, what we learned? Okay, so that's the basic uh, problem in, uh, uh, in uh, dynamics. And, uh, so I have the rocket, I want to be on board of this rocket, I want to have uh, a gravity like on the Earth, so that I can, uh, uh, I, I don't float around. So the best way is to have the rocket accelerate as G, then uh, you are like in an elevator, and uh, so inside, in fact, this is Einstein elevator in a way, because if you are inside and you don't have windows, uh, there is no way that you can tell whether you are on a rocket moving with constant acceleration G, or you are in a gravitational field, right? That was uh, Einstein's observation and the starting point of general relativity. Okay, that's another class. But uh, so how, how uh, I want to solve uh, this, uh, um, this problem, uh, and so it's a bit, uh, so let, let me try to solve it. First, I write the velocity. So I know that the four velocity uh, of this, uh, of this uh, uh, rocket, uh, what, what is this? This is, was exercise number one. Uh, so it's C squared. So now in this nice unit, uh, it's just uh, minus one, right? Then uh, I have the uh, uh, acceleration. Now, an important property of the four, the four acceleration is that it's always orthogonal to the four velocity. So you define your acceleration. You do that, and uh, you discover that uh, it's always orthogonal. Maybe this should be an exercise. So this is just d u d tau, right? Because I define the velocity to be d x d tau. So this, if, if, if you know, if, uh, so uh, you see, but this follows from this, right? So, okay, let, uh, convince yourself that uh, this is true, that a dot u is equal to zero. But it's already in here. You see, this is a strange, this is, is a vector that has constant uh, size, right? Because you see that the, scala, the square of the vector by itself is constant. So if you take a, a, the time derivative, 
respect due to the proper time of this quantity, you get something that will necessarily have this property. So, but please do it and convince yourself. So you see, it's strange. The, the, the four ac this is not true in, in, in the ordinary space, right? Uh, Three-dimensional space where the acceleration certainly is not, I mean, it can happen that is uh, like in a, uh, yeah, circular uh, uniform motion where the acceleration is in fact orthogonal, but in general uh, it's not true. But this is always true that in four-dimensional space the full acceleration is always orthogonal to the... And uh, what is the, the square of the acceleration? Well, this depends on the problem, but in this case we have decided that the acceleration is constant and has a value g. So, so this, these are the conditions uh, that define my problem. So if I solve those, I should get the, the, the solution. <coughs> In fact, I will get the Newton's law for this, uh, uh, how I will apply to this. So you see, uh, so let me write this. So this is minus u0 or ut, whatever your, your pref, ux squared, right? And this is minus at, the time component or zero component ut plus ax ux. And this, of course, is a uh, t square plus a uh, x square. So I'm assuming this is the direction x. So everything, whatever happened in the y, z direction, I don't care because I'm moving in a fixed direction that I decided to call x. So the other components I can neglect completely. So from this one, from this one, okay, let's write it this way. You see that I can write a t, the, the time component of my of my acceleration, okay, uh, is equal to a x. I take it on the other side, that is zero, uh, times the ratio of the two component of the velocity. Uh -huh. On the other hand, uh, from from this one. Uh, you see that, uh, uh, you see, a, uh, this is, is proportional to ax by this factor. So this, I can write it simply as ax square 1 minus ux ut square, and this must be equal to g square. So from this second equation, by using the one I just derived. On the other hand, uh, from here, I see that uh, uh, take this, divide both sides by ut square, then you get that 1 over ut square is equal minus 1 plus the ratio of ux square over ut square, right? But you see this is... Uh, One, uh, yeah. Thank you. So now I can re take this and replace it there, right? So that, in fact, uh, uh, I get uh, just uh, 1 over uh, ax squared divided by ut squared. Or, in other words, from the last one, I get that the x component of my acceleration, the x component of my, of my acceleration is uh, the t component of the velocity time g, right? And the t component of my acceleration, the t component of my acceleration is, uh, uh, is, is uh, the x component time g. Okay, so I've, 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 I've reduced the problem. I found the component of my acceleration in, acceleration in terms of, uh, of the components of my velocity. Therefore, now if I, you see this, this thing here is the, is the acceleration. So, so uh, let's take the, the derivative of this so that I can replace... Uh, take the time derivative, the proper time derivative of this. 
So this, is, this was already the proper time derivative of the ux. So now it's the second time derivative of the co x component of the velocity with respect to the proper time, right? I'm taking proper derivative here and here. So, yeah. Where? This? No, it's 1 minus, because it's, you see, it's minus minus. So I take uh, this on the other side. No, but it goes on the other. change right so you say it's plus so if you take uh, the so then on this side g is a constant so this is just g d u t d proper time right but this is uh, the acceleration, right, by definition. So this is a, a G A T, so it's G square yes, U X, yes. Why you change that? Why? Yeah. Uh, minus, minus one. Minus one. Where? It was correct, I mean. Yeah, this. I think it's correct. Let, let's correct. What? Huh? Can I? No, I, I, I don't care. I, I just. Why two choose? Ah, you mean I took the square root? Because they, they are, they, you want them to be positive, so, I mean, you have the choice, but no. Let's take a, I mean, you, strictly speaking, you have a plus and minus, but let's take the positive. So now I have an equation that uh, uh, I, I know. So now I want to find uh, the, the velocity, right? And uh, you see, now I have uh, an equation that I know how to solve. Because the second derivative of this minus g squared, the function, equal to 0. So that uh, is not, uh, I mean, it's not a trigonometric. It's, again, this uh, cinch. A, a hyperbolic cosine. So the solution of this differential equation uh, must be a combination of, say, a cinch of g tau plus uh, another constant that depends on the boundary condition, uh, the, the hyperbolic. In fact, I can fix these boundary conditions by, let's assume that at the beginning you start from rest at rest, so you have a, a zero component. And you see that uh, by definition, then there, you start with, the, uh, uh, say, uh, at the initial proper time with the, this constant acceleration, right? Now, these conditions, you see, you want at the time tau equal to zero 
uh, then therefore this uh, uh, must be equal to zero. And, uh, and also because you want that to be exactly equal to g, this is equal to one. So that's your solution. The solution of this motion is the the the, the space-like component of your for, for velocity that is the derivative of the position with respect to the proper time is the cinch, right? And the, the T component, the other component, <coughs> uh, uh, you see, is just the, it's just the, the, is dt, d tau, so it's the hyperbolic cosine. Do you see that? Because of this, right? If this, if this is the uh, hyperbolic sine, you see that uh, the hyperbolic sine minus the hyperbolic cosine, is it? So from there you get the, the other. And now you can integrate this because you have the velocity. So if you just take the, the integral with respect to the proper time, it's going to give you the trajectory because I get x as a function of the proper time, not the time, is the integral of this. So it's 1 over g, the hyperbolic uh, sine of g tau minus 1, right? That is the integral of this. And t of tau. Is just uh, the one that satisfies these boundary conditions. So you see, in this language, the, the, the trajectory of your particles, you write it uh, uh, x and t as a function of the proper time. So it's very different. Before, we were writing, for us, the trajectory in uh, Newtonian physics was the x as a function of t, little t. Now t is just the, another component of your of the vectors of, of your position in space time. And they are both parameterized not by t, that is a component, but by the proper time. That is the clock that uh, is running with you. So remember, now the position of an object is a vector in space time. So it has four components. In this ca case, just two components because we collapse the three-dimensional space along just one direction. And to describe the motion, you have to tell me the position and the time as a function of the proper time. So that's the solution of the problem. In fact, here you have now, if you use this solution, for instance, uh, let's t is the time uh, of somebody who, who stay behind, right, on the Earth. Yes, t tau is the proper time on the, on the ship. So if, 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 if you wait for the years, so you stay back on the earth, a, a, a you, well, a, you, you go to the gym because you want to lose <laughs> that famous kilos, and, and you wait, uh, so you, you go on for 40 years, you'll see it's not enough to lose uh, that kilo, but still you, you keep on going, and then you ask uh, what is the, what is the proper time after 40 years on the Earth on the ship, right? Well, to get that, you just need to, to invert. You see, this is your trajectory. So you need to take, uh, take g on the other side, then take the inverse function of the, of the hyperbolic sign. So I guess tau is, uh, well, uh, is roughly 1 over g, the inverse function of 40, because it's t, times g. There is a, I mean, this is equal. And then, uh, um, now g, if you take c equal to 1, is roughly, if c equals 1, g is like 1 over time. It's about 1 here. So you can uh, essentially put 1 here in these units. And therefore, here it's uh, of 40 that I check is uh, roughly 4.4 years. 
if you take the inverse uh, hyperbolic function of 40, you get uh, uh, 4.5, 4. So you see uh, the proper time on the on the spaceship is just uh, you, you, uh, just four years and a half, uh, and uh, so that's the usual things that uh, brings back to the twins that uh, the guy who's moving very fast because he's accelerating, so very fast is moving very close to the speed of light, uh, is uh, time is is uh, much slower than uh, for the guy who's uh, left behind. As measured by the guy here. Because remember, the paradox comes from the fact that it is completely symmetric for the guy uh, on the other one. And, uh, uh, yeah. That's, uh, that's your, this is a coordinate, it, it has this uh, shape. So the trajectory, let me draw the trajectory. I can draw this. Uh, so if this is x and this is t, right? Now your trajectory is, uh, uh, is, is this curve, so it's something like this. I mean, c is equal to 1, so the speed of light is... And uh, so you start somewhere here. So this is before you start, and then you move like this. This is your trajectory. Because you see, x plus 1 over g <coughs> square minus t square is equal 1 over g square, right, from this equation. So you can draw this curve, and it's this curve here. So you start some, at t equal to 0, you start from some point that you, and then you move in this form. And you see, you never reach the, the the speed of light, right? Light is like a horizon. You never penetrate or beyond, and that's the, the way it is. I mean, you, you, sh you, you shouldn't think of time as time. Time is just a coordinate in this uh, xt plane. And uh, uh, you are following the motion with the... So you, what you call time is really the proper time, that is the ticking of this uh, clock on board of the ship. So that's really the proper time, what we think of time. But time as a coordinate of space-time is a very different thing. And uh, in this case, it has this shape. You see, so the, 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 this, this is the solution of the uniformly uh, accelerated motion. Uh, of course, at the very beginning, right? Okay, well. So that was a basic uh, exercise in uh, relativistic dynamics, but now we, we really, we, we don't, I mean, this is only accessory to our uh, study of the electromagnetic field. So let's uh, move on to the next step. So I, I wrote the velocity, accelerations, and all this stuff in this language. So how about the Lorentz force? Lorentz force, that's where we started, and back we are, right? So I want, so this we wrote it in a three-dimensional space as a, the, um, the, the MA, the, the change in momentum for a particle with charge Q is E, the electric field, V over C cross B. Now I'm in... CGS or uh, uh, this uh, Gauss unit, I guess. So I want to write it now. <laughs> I 
we, we, I hope we agree now that this uh, is not the best way to write this uh, uh, equation because we want to write it in this uh, space-time invariant form or covariant form. So I want to use uh, uh, a manifestly covariant form. So I have to rewrite that in terms of this object that I introduced, that is the, the, the four momentum. So let's put it here, the, the four momentum. So this is the four momentum, and I also... Uh, hope uh, uh, that I convince you that uh, t is not uh, a good parameter in this problem. I, sh I should use the proper time. Okay? T is not a good parameter because it's a coordinate. Okay? And... Uh, This, I, I like to, to write it in a form that is a, a little bit... Uh, uh, so let's write it like this. QC, then here I have... Uh, you see, I'm trying to write this as a product or something. So here I have some zero component of some velocity plus the space component time V, okay? So th this, these things here should be a four vector. Right, because this is a four vector. So let me put it. It's a four vector. And, and then, therefore, this combination, I pull out the C so that I have a, a common V and vectors here. So this object should be a four vector, okay? And uh, I assume, because I had the velocity here, I, I'm, I'm guessing, but uh, uh, I put the velocity also here although the time component of this velocity. So how do you get, you see, you want to get the vector by multiplying something by a vector, right? So it's a QC, this is a scalar. And then the only way, so you see, if you put, uh, so let me put it like this, dP alpha d tau, this is a QC, then there is, then this is proportional to a velocity that I promote to be a four velocity, but then to go from a four velocity back to a velocity by multiplying something, you need a tensor here. Right? There is no other way. Otherwise, it's only proportional. But you, you don't want this to be proportional because you know that the, fo the force is not proportional to the velocity because it gets twisted by the electromagnetic field. So that means that uh, this is the generalization in uh, four dimensions uh, of, the, of, the, of the Lorentz force. But unfortunately, you have to bring in what is a four tensor. If this was a four vector, this is a four tensor, meaning a tensor, two indices, but these indices run from zero to, uh, to three right, why all the other tensors, uh, they were running only over three components, okay? And what are, what, what are the components of these tensors? Well, you can read them off from this because you want to, to get this back, right? And if you do that, uh, maybe this is an exercise or, or, or just, uh, you see that uh, it's a tensor that has uh, these components. So on this, the, the time like uh, time, well, first of all, it is anti-symmetric. So it, it has zeros along the diagonal. Then the, the mixed component time space are given by, by the electric field, while the, the space space components are components of the B field. And because it's anti-symmetric, you, you know that this must be these others. So you see how beautiful it is. In this language, you don't have the electric and the magnetic field. You have a, a unique object that is the electromagnetic four tensors usually indicated as F <coughs> alpha beta, the component of which are the component of the electric and the magnetic vector field arranged in that way. In fact, you can check that when you project this, 
down, so let's check what uh, we get now. Uh, if you take the, the component alpha equal one, two, three, that is the space, space uh, component, you get exactly Lorentz force. You can check, in fact, check. I mean, it, it takes a second. Check it. How about the, the so, okay, so this is, a fa it, it, it's actually a good generalization because it goes back to what we had if we stick to the space part. How about the, the time part? So the time part is P0 d tau. Then I have to pick the, the, the so this is now is fixed to 0. So I'm reading uh, these components here. And you see that you get the, uh, 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 the charge, the charge uh, uh, QC then uh, you see this is just the scalar product. You see, you fix this to zero, so you are reading these directions. So is the scalar product of E times V. And you see this is C, C, D, T. So if you put, you get rid of this, and P zero is the energy, right? So you see, that's correct, because this is the, the the energy in the process. Actually, it's the, 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 the power, right? Because the energy is uh, E times, uh, this, uh, E times the velocity gives you the, the change in energy. Sir? Yes. Traceless, it, because it's anti-symmetric. What does this imply? I mean, does it have any physical meaning? Mm, well, it, it, because you see, it, it, it has only, you see, one, two, three, four, five, six. You want this to have six independent components, because you start out with six, three plus three independent components. So a four by four, Arbitrary tensors has many more, it has 16 independent components. But if it is anti-symmetric, you understand that uh, it has only one, two, three, four, five, six. Because the others are, I mean, it must be tr zero component here on the, on, the, on the diagonal, and the others are simply the same change by sign. So the requirement that you only have six independent components, this must be anti-symmetric. I mean, it's not the physical requirements, it's uh, the requirements of, uh, of the number of independent components in this equation. So now, uh, then I stop. Uh, we, we have, uh, do they, so this tensor is uh, what we, is replaces the, our uh, E and B uh, uh, field strengths. And therefore, I must be able to write uh, the Maxwell equations in this language. And to do that, uh, 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 I have to introduce two things. First, I introduce, you see, I ha in the Maxwell equation, I have uh, the charge density and the current density. So wouldn't that be beautiful to have these two to be components of the four vectors? And indeed, they are in the four vectors C times rho j. And the other thing you need to know is that, uh, again, uh, you can pull together in a four vector the gradient and the time derivative. Therefore, you can introduce the alpha to be defined as this. And you understand this is minus the x0 plus uh, I mean, uh, and uh, the gradient as a space component. You see how, uh, how everything. Therefore, for instance, the conservation law is very simple, right? Because d alpha g alpha equal to zero. And uh, if you take d alpha f alpha beta, so you take the four, uh, the four derivative, so this is the four derivative, this is the four current, 
uh, if you take the the uh, the, the full derivative of this uh, electromagnetic tensor, this is equal, now I'm using Gauss unit because these knots are in Gauss units. Uh, this is 4 pi C G alpha. And you can check, so this is check it too. Write the components and uh, you will see that this this, this equation gives you back the two Maxwell equations that are those uh, with the charges and current densities, that is uh, Gauss and Ampere, right? And how about the others? You see the other two are the one without the charge density and the current density are sort of a constraint on the structure, right? It's the one that tells you that the divergence of B is equal zero that essentially is, you say it doesn't tell you what B is, but it tells you that B must be uh, divergentless. And similarly, the other one is with the with the curl, the curl of E and the time de derivative of B. But you see, in this language, uh, time derivative and curl they come together, and they come together, uh, and so you have this uh, equation here. So again, try to write back uh, the components E and B here, right here, th this is a derivative. And you will see that this, this, th this equation gives back the two other Maxwell equations, the one without charge and uh, current density. So that's good, uh, uh, that's what I wanted to to uh, rederive, so now we are back to our first uh, uh, first lectures. We are back to Maxwell equations, but now uh, we rewrote them in this uh, uh, more uh, efficient uh, formalism that uh, relies on four vectors and four tensors. That is objects that live naturally in uh, in four dimensions, and you see that it's much more compact and. Uh, uh, so now we, we, we will study these equations uh, uh, directly and uh, re-derive some of the results. That's what is left. In particular, for instance, in this language it's very it's trivial to derive uh, uh, the linear vector potentials, right? Because, uh, uh, of course, uh, also the, the potentials, right, you understand, maybe with the C, the, the, the scalar potential, I mean, you have a C, but let's, let's stick with C equal to 1. So also the scalar potential and the vector potential, obviously, they fall into a four vector. And therefore, uh, you see that the questions to compute the, the potential for, for instance, a, a, a charge moving with constant speed that uh, we sort of spend last uh, time trying to derive, then it becomes just a matter of Lorentz transformation of a Coulomb potential to a frame that is moving with constant speed, right? So if you apply Lorentz transformations to this component, when you take this equal to zero and this equal to a Coulomb potential, then you boost it to a frame that is moving with velocity v, that's exactly a charge moving with velocity v, and you derive the potential in just a single line. This is the power of the language, right? And so we will do that, and then, uh, <coughs> yeah, I'm running out of time, uh, and then uh, uh, I want to write the Lagrangian, because at the end of the day, <laughs> I promised that we will write, so I want to write the Lagrangian, uh, from which uh, it's possible to derive these equations and this, and then we are essentially done. So if we have time, we will also rederive the radiation field that, as you will see, is much simpler in this language, because uh, you you simply do the Fourier transform in four dimensions, and then everything becomes much simpler. 
understand what we did before in three dimensions. Okay?